was the second hand was there. Yes, please. Namaskar. Say your name, please. My name is Niranjana. I'm Sanyasin. But I don't want to ask a question. I want you to ask for, um, as my mom last night, she went through a difficult uh, surgery on the vertebra. I want to ask you to send her some love and light to go through whatever she's going through now. I don't know how she is. She'll be fine. So, yeah. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> okay. She has a loving daughter, that's for sure. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Namaskar, Mia. Namaskar. Um, the question is, what is the difference between the full enlightenment and partial enlightenment? We spoke about this yesterday a little bit, also in regards to the integration. I also saw videos where I mentioned uh, par for partial enlightened beings, they can actually integrate versus the full enlightened ones who cannot, or if I understood correctly. When a person takes up very extreme practices, be they meditation, they could, they could be chanting, they could be holding bandhas for a long time. They could, it could also be a result of extreme alcohol consumption or also uh, substances. It could be a result of ayahuasca, it could be bufo, it could be many things. The consciousness is actually pushed out of the system. It's a way of saying it, it's a way of simplifying it. And then what happens is, is that there is a dissolution of identity. So as this consciousness moves away from the body, and some of you here would have had this experience, um, it starts to become a perceiving identity and the body sort of falls away. And in the beginning of that experience, the, this perceiving identity is still in touch with the body. The body is still available. And increasingly, the body becomes less and less available and it just becomes a perceiving identity. So it's just there in the cosmos and it's perceiving, but there's no real body attached to it. So we are still in a so-called, so-called partial enlightenment. I'm talking about enlightenment here, not in literary terms as it is generally used in the whole New Age literature. I'm talking about it in classical terms where enlightenment means an actual and total dissolution of identity. That's what I'm talking about. So, so when it is in this partial state, it's also called savikalpa samadhi, which means there are partial attributes meaning you are still relating partially to your body, you're still relating to the environment, you can still almost say recognize the stars, you can still feel a connect to the body, but there comes a point when even that is not there, there is no more identification anymore, so that's why when the person comes back from that state, they don't know where they've been but they know that they were somewhere. That state is more an enlightened state where there is just no connection whatsoever with the body and its reality. So then starts the reintegration process and that reintegration process which basically means re-entering the body and populating it again solidly, that process is far more challenging if the person has stayed in that nirvikalpa samadhi state, which is total dissolution of the body in terms of consciousness and perception. So that is what makes it very difficult to reintegrate. It is still possible, but total reintegration where you actually sit fully in the system, totally, is very, very difficult to attain if you have... Uh, if you have 
been in Nirvikalpa Samadhi states for a longer period of time. It's not, it's not, it's not at all easy actually. But if you have been in partial states where there is still a connect with the body, that would be easier to, to attain. I think you've had those moments where there is no connect at all, right? Yes. Uh, yes, there were experiences, but throughout the living, um, there's a connect here. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. Can you speak uh, so that I understand what you're saying? So the no connect with the body at all, oh, I no. had a few... Presence. <laughs> it's difficult to speak about it, but you have to try to be clear. Yes. But you're much more clear than you were two years ago when I saw you. So the reintegration is happening with you. So I, I would say I'm more in the Savikalpa Samadhi most of the time. So there is the body, I can feel it now as well, it's a little bit. And the nobody at all, I only had uh, one, exp maybe a few more experiences for I don't know how long, but maybe half an hour or something. Well, you can't know unless you looked at the watch. Yes. Because it's timelessness then. I don't know, between f 10 and 30 minutes, something like that. So for you, the reintegration into the body will be a little bit more challenging. And it is also, and one can see it when one talks to you. You know, you're there is a sort of a slight helplessness and in earlier times these samadhi states people in those enlightened states they used to be looked up to because they had no emotions they were detached from everything and so it was considered to be an attainment ah this person is actually without emotions how lucky I want to be like that too I don't want attachment to my family I don't want attachment to my partner or my children people were so plagued by their emotional attachments that they wanted relief and so they tried to find this relief outside the system and they looked up to people who were in that detached state. When I speak about reintegration, I'm saying to reintegrate into the body so that you can function with a very high level of presence and dignity and you're not just in floaty states, but are connected to source because you're so present and therefore connected to the source of the other. And so it results in a very... Uh, it results in a life which is no more a life in that sense, but it's a vibrant living. And so if I look at you, how you looked two years ago when you were in the satsang, you were really half as present as you are today, so you are reintegrating. Whether you will be able to completely reintegrate is a question mark. It will remain to be seen. Including also emotional connect to anybody. Yeah. yeah. Also, uh, four or five days ago, I was uh, having an experience. I was lying in, in bed and um, I don't know what triggered it, but I could feel um, falling, surrendering into the body. And I was just looking at the room and everything was more present, more vibrant. I cannot explain it as well now because I don't have that experience now. Um, but everything was good, everything was fine and I could feel myself from inside out and I still had the, the bliss that I always have but now from the body so it was much more uh, real and much more enjoyable also and it was so intense I could only lie there and just enjoy it. I couldn't, I could also do things, but I just enjoyed it. And I fell asleep like this and everything was fine. Next morning when I woke up, um, I'm back out of the body. So what, what is happening? 
This reintegration process is something which takes time. That state that you felt when you were really solidly in the body, present, with that bliss feeling of presentness, this is something that a lot of people, they live all the time because they've never left the system. So it's a natural state of being. It is the actual state of being. It's like when you see this, uh, this iconic image of uh, of this child sitting under a tree in the, in the outback and just, just gazing at the vastness of the, of the bush. And he's just there and he's present and he's just aware. He's not spaced out, he's present. That experience is natural to the human and has been lost because of the takeover of ego. When, when a person goes into a samadhi state, it means the consciousness is no more in charge of the body. It's lost the connect with the body or it's got a very minimal connect. And what keeps the body intact and moving is the ego. And that will always cause suffering to the body. That's why people who are in enlightened states, their bodies are often just not taken care of. And to learn to reintegrate means to learn to be... to feel the bliss of, of thisness and being present. So the default tendency of the body for you is to be out. The ego does not want presentness. Ahankar does not want presentness because presentness means the consciousness and the awareness is centered here and now and tuning in to the other. The ego doesn't want that. The ego is actually, you know, it's the socialization construct. It's the lie, the big lie that stands in the way of you and your Antarguru, your Antaratman, the Truth. So, it takes time for you to reintegrate and you can only reintegrate if you, if you bend always to the Antarguru's impulse, the Truth impulse, the Truth impulse, not the ego, not the Ahankar, the Truth impulse, the Truth impulse, the Truth impulse again and again and again. And gradually, if you actually practice that sadhana, this experience you had will become longer and longer. You'll stretch it in time. Till there comes a point when you're sitting in that pretty much all the time. In your case, it might not be that you can sit in it 100%, depending on how long you were out floating, but it can be, it can be quite, quite full. One more thing, I experienced in this state, I don't know if it was imagination or not. Um, I could also I don't see the maybe spirit word, I don't know, but I felt your presence there and you were sealing off my, the top of my head. Was that imagination or...? Have you ever heard that I do that? Yes. In, the, in one of the in, in, um, in, intensives, I think. So I never, I never ever ever go towards somebody and do anything without their permission. Only if there is a permission, I will do it. It can be that there are forces at play that are, you know, uh, making a certain sealing process happen. So sealing means to help in the integration so that you stay within the system and you don't, you know, you're not forced out. But did I come there and do it in a spiritual sense, in a subtle um, sukshma sort of sense? No. I don't do such things. No exceptions. I don't do it even, even technically, like if she comes and asks, uh, me to send prayers to her mother, I can't do that unless her mother asks me. I, 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 can't, I cannot do that. 
because they are Siddhis. It's not so difficult to get a Siddhi, but you know, one has to be very careful. One has to ensure that one is. Uh, that one is not using the powers one has to interfere in someone else's sphere of autonomy. That's very crucial. So if someone comes and asks me, that's one thing. But sending something like she asked me out of love for her mother, directly sending, I can't. I did feel her mother's presence immediately. But directly I cannot do that, unless her mother asks. Sometimes, you know, people come and ask me, can you not make him realize something about <laughs> me? No? Or something along those lines, didn't we hear it recently? How to make somebody open their heart or things like that. I cannot go and do that, I can only Sometimes I see what will happen, then that's another story. So, no, it was not a conscious effort on my part. It's possible that it was an energetic experience which you connected with me. Yes. That's possible, yes. Yes, whenever I'm with you, I feel this energy yes. uh, sealing off. Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. yes. That, that, is, that is true, yes, it happens. Also because the Kundalini Shakti is what is pushing out that, uh, that energy when it is disturbed. Generally, people who do a lot of meditations and a lot of... lot of... like uh, they go to a program maybe and then they follow some... some extreme yogic practices, but the teacher is not with them, is not there to guide them, is not... it's all done in a sort of... Um, experimental fashion where maybe they just watch the yogic practices and then they follow the teacher or it's done as a course or things like that. Then these practices trigger the Shakti because, you know, when I was a child, I've told this story many times actually, there was a... there was a, a... quite a famous yogi who had come to Mumbai and he was teaching Hatha Yoga, just simple Hatha Yoga, not, not some, uh, some exotic thing. So then my grandmother was there, so I was talking about it, ah, there's this yogi has come and, you know, he's teaching Hatha Yoga and she said, no, but you can't go just and learn Hatha Yoga, who is he? What is his lineage? Where did he learn? You have to go find out all these things and even then you have to take permission of the... of the gurus and of the gods and like it's a huge thing to go and learn Hatha Yoga. And today there are people sitting in Rishikesh and they are holding bandhas for like four and five hours and they are triggering the Kundalini because when the body is under traumatic conditions the Kundalini will trigger and then she comes to the rescue and in her act of coming to the rescue because she's been disturbed that's when the consciousness gets pushed out. So when... when I'm sealing it, it's actually... it's quietening her down. That's something that happens around me to people who have that, which is why I say that if somebody has that issue that, you know, they should come at least to get some relief. It won't last for long, but it... It's, at least there's some initial bit of relief. We have seen that many times in the satsang, those in physical pain also. So yes, it, it's possible that that process is working with you so that you can reintegrate fully. I mean, technically, a guy of your age, I mean, you should be having four children already. Instead of floating in the cosmos, checking out Mars and, and Venus. Not even Venus enough. <laughs> if you checked out Venus, at least there would be some babies, no? <laughs> yeah, that's coming, coming. That is because you people go and do all this stuff without your teachers teaching you surrender, samarpan. Without samarpan, it is just triggering the Shakti. Even, even to have a guru and to love a guru is not an easy thing. It takes a lot of... a lot of uh, strength. 
You know, when people come and say they have a guru, you better respect them because if it's a guru that's straightening them out, it's not an easy thing at all. It's very tough. They're crying all the time. I mean, it's not easy. That, that is a decision to take. So without that samarpan, without that bending, just to do courses, that results in such things. I don't know in your case if you've done it, but it would generally be you have. Yeah. Exactly. And some people are doing kundalini yoga. It's nonsense. Put that up, put it up in, in wherever, whoever's ready to listen to me. Kundalini yoga, there are ten people in the world who can, who can do that and even that's experimental in nature. It's not meant to be done, you know, just one week of Kundalini yoga and then the, the, the Shakti gets triggered and after that nobody's there to help those poor people. The suffering, deep, deep suffering. It's so dangerous. the discipline to take up a guru that you can learn from, that you can focus on, who's teaching, whichever one it is, you have one in... where do you live? In Berlin. Yes, in Berlin. You have one there, whoever, it doesn't matter, but then to stay with it, to stay with it with a sort of, at least a modicum of, uh, of loyalty, of focus, of you know, do your daan, do your seva, do your dakshina, these are all strong things to keep you in, 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 a, in a certain path which, which gives you strength in your life. Raise a family, you know. On the one hand you raise a strong family and on the other hand you, you move into self-knowledge. What could be better than this? And instead of floating around and then somehow, you know, self... selfing, <laughs> doing you, there's nothing more ridiculous than to do you. I have to do me. That's... no, you don't have to do you. You have to do the other, in every sense of that phrase, by the way. Yeah, next time come with some children or something. <laughs> okay, thank you. Then you'll be really in bliss in the body because they will be there causing you a lot of... they'll be peeing on your computer half the time. So... You'll be alive, alert, present. It's tough, it's not easy to raise children, but it's an amazing ego-breaking exercise. Yes, I, I love children. Yeah. You do? Yes. That's a, that's a good start. Well then... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't look so worried, it's fine, it'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, if I have children, they will uh, be like the ones here. <laughs> now, those are, those are uh, very challenging. Okay. But you know why they are so... why they, these children are quite upbeat and quite, you know, one of the biggest reasons is that they don't get any sugar except when they steal it, then we don't know about that part. But they don't just don't get any sugar at all and they get a lot of attention, continuous attention from everyone. Very important with a child is presence. Presence with the child, don't, don't give it presence, give it presence. That's so crucial. Well, let's see how you do. It was this one, then after... Uh, no, first you, with the blue shirt, and then after that you, yes. 